So uh, today's talk uh, is by Jean Abrams from University of Colorado, Colorado Springs, as you can see. Uh, and his title is Morita Equivalence for Gay Rings. Please, Jean, go ahead. Thank you very much. Thank you very, very much for the opportunity. I know that this particular seminar isn't necessarily focused on algebra per se. Maybe it's more some analysis or non-commutative geometry. But what I'd like to do is give uh, a, a relatively basic algebra talk for 20, 25 minutes or so. I'll give you some background and some history of the question that we were considering and then try to give some connections between what we're doing and maybe some of the topics that uh, some of you are a little bit more familiar with. So first, this is a uh, joint work with Efren Ruiz and uh, my colleague at UCCS, Mark Tomford. And most of you know both of them. So I'll set some notation to begin with. Um, everything, Everything indicated by a single letter will be uh, a, a unital associative ring. Uh, the notation mod A is the category of right A modules and A module homomorphisms as is standard. So let me talk a little bit about uh, equivalence of categories. So the, the, the question generally is, you have these two categories. So what should it mean for the categories to be the same, indistinguishable, as far as information about the objects and the morphisms in the category. That's the general question that we ask from the algebra side. Okay, the, the guiding example, the basic example is this. If you take any, okay, let's say unital ring R and you look at the N by N matrix ring over R, then those module categories are equivalent. Obviously the rings themselves might be very far one from the other from being isomorphic, but the categories of modules over these things are in some sense the same, and it's not hard to write down a functor, a way of associating each object in mod R with an object in the N by N matrix ring over R. And what's, I, I would say, most important here is not only can you identify an object in mod R with an object in the two by two matrix ring over R, but the point is when you do this identification of objects, for instance, here in this example of two by two matrices over R, that the appropriate morphisms match up correctly, that the morphisms from a module M to a module N over R is the same as what you get if you look at the morphisms viewed as modules over the two by two matrix ring of the appropriate image. So these rings match up nicely as far as their categories of modules go, but just to keep you a little bit honest, for those of you that maybe aren't so familiar with this notion of equivalence of categories, I mean, if you think take, I, I mean, I've written down the reals and the complexes here, but take any two fields, then the fields, of course, they're not isomorphic if you give me different fields, but it's also the case that their categories of modules can't be the same either. I mean, if you're thinking, well, I just take a vector space of dimension n here, and I map it to a vector space of dimension n here, the problem is, or the issue is that the appropriate morphisms won't work out correctly, that the morphisms are not gonna be isomorphic in the correct way. So the good example to keep in mind of rings that are equivalent, namely that their module categories are equivalent, are a ring and n by n matrices over the ring. Okay, some, I'll try to keep the definitions to a minimum here. Uh, take an idempotent in a ring, the idempotent is called full if the two-sided ideal generated by that idempotent gives the entire ring. And it's important to keep in mind when we use the notation capital S, E, capital S, it means not only elements of the form S1, E, S2, it means sums of elements of those forms. And so as a good example, take the N by a matrix ring over R, take the idempotent in the one, one coordinate, which is one there and zeros everywhere else, then this is full in the N by a matrix ring. There's nothing special about E11. You can do this for EII for any I, of course. And the point is, if you give me E11 and you've given me the entire matrix ring, then of course you can produce each EIJ by an appropriate multiplication. Okay, so this is a good example to keep in mind. So we say, this is on the algebra side at least, if the module categories over the ring R and the ring S are equivalent, we say that the two rings are Morita equivalent. 
presumably we should talk in theory about left meridian equivalent or right meridian equivalent, depending on whether we're looking at the categories of right modules or left modules. But it turns out in the end, one can show that those two ideas turn out to be the same, that left meridian equivalents and right meridian equivalents. Are... Okay, and here's the notation, M-E. So here's some history. This is the, I'll call it the original Morita theorem. And Morita proved the following. This was back in 1958, that there are three ways to understand when the categories of modules over the rings R and S are the same. They're the same precisely when there's a relationship between R and S in the sense that you can find some integer N and build the N by N matrix ring over S and then find some full idempotent in the matrix ring so that R and this thing we call the corner E, M and S, E are isomorphic. So equivalence of categories can be distilled into an isomorphism between something involving the underlying rings, R and S. And then third, there's a condition that says if you've got two bimodules uh, over the appropriate rings on either side and you tensor appropriately that you get all of the ring back on either side. So this was the original Morita theorem. It's, it's sort of interesting to note historically, I mean, look at the title of Morita's paper, Duality for Modules. And so, I mean, Morita's paper is six chapters. Five out of the six chapters are about a, a, a different but related notion of duality where things involve contravariant functors. And there was one chapter about equivalence, and it turns out historically then the one chapter of equivalence, which is written in a form that makes it seem as though Morita just sort of saw this and threw it down as, well, I have this information, I'm just going to put it in the paper. It turns out to be, I think, his most important contribution. Okay. Uh, next. So if you take any ring, this notation, and the notation is not completely standard, We'll, we'll write Fm some infinity of T to denote the countably infinite square matrices that contain at most finitely many non-zero entries. So it's infinite matrices, but I only allow you to put finitely many non-zero uh, entries in each matrix. So this is a perfectly good ring. Multiplication is fine because you have zeros everywhere. You have zeros in enough places to make the multiplication well-defined. And so you get a ring. It's not a unital ring because I haven't given you the what presumably would be the identity element in here. But there are at least, I mean, if you hand me any element in here, you can find a, a, an identity matrix, a finite identity matrix of a big enough size that behaves like an identity element to each one. Okay. We'll call this local identities. and But we still get this notion of fullness. We can still get any element of FMT by looking at the ideal generated by E11. Okay, so now there's a fourth condition that's equivalent to the three conditions that Morita originally wrote in his theorem. And the condition four is that the FM infinity matrices over R and S are isomorphic as rings. And this fourth condition appeared in Stevenson's thesis, you know, five, six, seven years after Morita's paper originally appeared. So here's condition four. I want to talk about condition four for a little bit. Uh, so we have these four equivalent conditions, and I'm going to refer to those as the extended Morita theorem. So the original three conditions that Morita gave, one about categories, one about an isomorphism between certain rings, and one about some sort of maps from, uh, from tensor products of bimodules. And now we have this fourth condition. Right, so here are a few comments on this fourth condition, this M4 condition. The, the proof that Stevenson gave in his thesis that this condition M4, this isomorphism, implies that the rings R and S are really equivalent. Uh, use some tools that Stevenson built in his thesis about lattices of submodules of various modules over various rings. So he brought some uh, new tools to the table in order to prove one direction of this result. And a comment now is this, it turns out to show that this M4 condition implies Morita equivalence of the rings. All right, there were some tools developed maybe 30 years ago or so where you could talk about the notion of modules over rings without identity, but rings that have local units or rings that have enough idempotence. 
And in that sense, what you can show is that just like any ring is Mariti equivalent to the n by a matrices over R for a finite n, it turns out any ring is also Mariti equivalent to the FM infinity of R. So if you assume that the FM R and FM S rings are isomorphic, then they're Mariti equivalent. And so if you assume that isomorphism, then certainly you get R is Mariti equivalent to S essentially immediately. Okay. Uh, comment three on Stevenson's proof is this, that to, to go the other way, if you assume the rings are Mariti equivalent, to show that you have an isomorphism between these FM rings, you first show that if you have a Mariti equivalence, that you get an isomorphism between bigger matrix rings, we'll call them RFM of ours. These are the infinite matrices where in each row, you only allow finitely many non-zero entries. So it's a bigger ring. In fact, these are unital rings. So if you have a Mariti equivalence, it's not hard to show that you get an isomorphism between these bigger matrix rings. And then what you do is just work hard to show that the isomorphism that you can write down, which is explicitly given, actually restricts to an isomorphism between these subrings. And so uh, I like to view the isomorphism that Stevenson found between the FM rings as being top down. You get an isomorphism between bigger matrix rings and then you restrict. Uh, comment four is this. Uh, Camillo in the early 80s gave this really nice proof that you can actually add a condition five to the original Merida theorem that the FM infinities are isomorphic as rings. So even though Stevenson proved one direction that if you have a Merida equivalence then you get an isomorphism between the RFMs, Camillo was actually able to show the converse as well. This is a, a beautiful paper if you have a chance to pull it up. And I think it's fair to say that it, even in the early mid eighties or so, the ring theorists weren't, weren't deeply involved in working with rings without identity. Okay, so clearly some people may object to that statement, but okay, these are non-unital rings. So I think when this additional condition, this M4 condition was written down, the ring theorists said, uh, okay, fine, but not so important. Good. So that's the, now we're done with the history lesson. Uh, uh, now may, some... may I ask one thing? Please, so really. I learned about this relation between the isomorphism of the M infinities and the Marita equivalence from a paper that you wrote. So, what was the, I mean, what, where does it enter in, in this uh, historical? Where, where does the history end? No, where, where does your paper enter in this uh, history? Oh, where does my paper? So thank you, thank you very much for asking. My paper enters in uh, in this comment number two. So uh, I think I helped to develop this notion of what it should mean to be the module category over a non-unital ring. And then it was not hard to show once you had the right idea of what modules over non-unital rings that have at least enough idempotents or sets of local units should be that you get this Mariti equivalence between R and FM, and then we were able to move forward. So thank, thank you for asking. Okay, thank you. Okay, next. So here's what it means to be a, a Z graded ring. So Z is the, the additive group of integers here. A ring is Z graded in case as in the additive structure, the ring decomposes as a direct sum of abelian subgroups indexed by the integers with the property that products of things in the appropriate subgroups behave correctly as far or as are consistent with the appropriate addition in the integers. So if you take something in the T component, something in U component, and you multiply, you get something in the T plus U component. Okay, the, this idea is, okay, can be done for any abelian group. We'll focus on the integers today. Uh, and, and notice what this means. This will be a little bit important later that this decomposition means that you can take any element of the ring and write it as a finite sum of elements inside whatever you're defining to be the appropriate components. Uh, there are many familiar and standard examples of Z-graded rings. Take the polynomial rings and the, Coordinates are 
the components are in the ith component, you put x to the i power times k. If i is bigger than or equal to zero, you put zeros everywhere else for all the negative components. Or if you look at the Laurent polynomials, so now you have the i component is kx to the i for every integer i. And the multiplication, in fact, unincludedly works out the way that you'd like. Okay, here's an, I mean, this is an example. It seems on the surface sort of trivial, but if you hand me any ring that's not a priori graded, you can always grade it. You put everything in the zero component and you move everything else out. Okay, so the, the point is when you do this decomposition, all you're requiring is that the components are abelian groups. But in particular, if you look at the zero component, the zero component times something is zero component has to give you something as zero plus zero component. So it turns out that the zero component at least is closed also under multiplication. So the zero component turns out to be a ring in its own right. Okay, so what we will wind up looking at is just because you hand me a ring and there's sort of a clear Z grading on it doesn't mean that you can't somehow change the grading around a little bit. For example, I mean, if I go back to this Laurent polynomial ring, if you simply define the even components to be KX to the T and the odd components to be zero, you get a perfectly good grading on the ring. It's the same ring. You've just graded it in a different way. Okay, so, I mean, there's, I'm not going to write out the definitions. There's some straightforward notion of what it means to uh, be a graded homomorphism and a graded isomorphism between Z-graded rings. It's just the standard ring theoretic notions where you assume also that the appropriate maps preserve the components and the gradings. Okay, first, straightforward, if you take a graded ring, then the n by n matrix ring is also naturally graded. The T component in the matrices, you just fill up the entries with the T component in the ring. And in the same way, these FM infinities are Z graded as well. So you start with a graded ring and you can put a grading then on any matrix ring, any matrix ring or F infinity, uh, FM infinity, and we'll call these the standard gradings on the matrix rings. Uh, a quick remark that, so the RFMs, these bigger rings are not Z graded because, okay, you're thinking, well, maybe I have some sense of how to Z grade them, but it's not the case that every element will then live in a finite sum of the way that you might naively try to define the components. And, okay, everything's going to be Z graded for me, so I'm just going to call them graded rings. Right, so it's this same idea just because you give me a, let's see, what's the way to think of this? Just because you give me a grading on a ring and there seems to be a natural one, I can always change the grading. For example, on the three by three matrix ring over a ring R, not necessarily graded, I can write down a grading on the three by three matrices that has nothing to do with any sort of grading or think a grading that comes from the description of the matrices. And here it is. I've simply written down a way of decomposing the three by three matrices in such a way that, well, the components multiply together correctly. So let me continue then. So the idea simply is that if you give me some ring graded or not that I can if I take a matrix ring, somehow use the matrix ring structure to produce a grading on the matrix ring. Okay, next, if we look at any corner uh, of a, a graded ring, then it turns out that the corner easily inherits a grading, which we'll also call the standard grading on the corner. You just grade by taking the T component to be the E times the T component of S. Right, so here turns out to be the key component to one piece of the theorem that will prove if you take uh, a graded ring and you take something in the zero component, then even if E is a full idempotent in the ring S, it might not be a full idempotent in the zero component. And a good example is in the previous uh, e example of a grading that I gave on a ring. So here 
in that grading is the zero component. And if you give me E11, okay, it's full in the full matrix ring. It's full in the ring, but it's not full in the zero component because E11 times anything in here is going to land in the E11 component again. Okay, but certainly there are situations where being full in the big ring does imply that the item potent is full in the zero component as well. Okay, so here, just as a reminder, were the uh, conditions M2 and conditions M4 in what we call the extended Morita theorem. And the question is, is there a graded version of this result? Because now if we take graded rings, we have a grading on the M infinities. And when you talk about gradings on the appropriate uh, corners of matrix rings, and the answer turns out to be yes. And this is what we call the algebraic stabilization theorem. If you take unital graded rings, you assume that the gradings on the rings that look like a matrix ring or a corner ring are the standard gradings, the one that you'd maybe naively expect to put on the appropriate rings, then it turns out that the following two conditions are equivalent, that the FM infinity rings are graded isomorphic in the standard grading is equivalent to, well, something that looks like the existence of a full idempotent, but here the idempotent has to be more than just full in the matrix ring, it has to be full in the zero component of the matrix ring. So there's the two statements that turn out to be equivalent. If you think of it this way, if you naively put the word graded in the old condition M4, the condition on the isomorphism between the FMs, and you simply say, well, let's just put the standard grading on there, then the appropriate M2 condition turns out to not just be the naive generalization, but in fact, we need this extra condition that the idempotent that you've got has to be full in the zero component. And we call this the algebraic stabilization theorem. So, so, so one uh, uh, really? question, you, you sure, surely said this, but uh, so the, a standard means that it's the grading in the ring tensor, the matrix ring. It's the tensor grading in the ring tensor. The, and not the, tensor the opposite the way, as, as, yeah. you, as in the example you showed before. Okay. Yeah, yeah. assuming you, that your ring is an algebra over some field, you take the funny, yeah. And in fact, we'll get to that. Yeah, hopefully. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you can do it with the indices, right? Yeah, yeah. Okay. So, I don't know, a, a very, very brief sketch of the proof. Yeah. Uh, okay. If you prove the situation where you simply take a corner ring of the ring itself, so n equals one, and you take an idempotent that's full in the zero component, then you can play the following game. And again, I'm not going to write down all the details. The point, though, is inside the FMs, you can build some appropriate uh, subrings, and you can show that those subrings are related nicely one to the other. And again, I'm going to just quickly get rid of this slide in such a way that you can build appropriate limits of certain expressions. And the only thing I want to point out is that the fullness of the idempotent in R0 comes into play here because then it turns out that these idempotent matrices that you can write down in the FM infinities can be chosen as matrices in RFM infinity of R0 as opposed to RF infinity of R. And in the end, what you wind up is getting that the two limits are the same and then the community of the diagram gives that the limits are not only isomorphic as rings, but in fact, graded isomorphic. Okay, so I'm going to sweep that under. Here is the idea of the proof, and there are a lot of details here, and there's a lot of checking to be done, but here are a couple of maybe important remarks, more so important than showing what the proof is. First, that the construction is something that uh, Efren and Mark were able to say, yeah, you know, there's this construction on the C-star algebra side done by by Brown, it was called the stabilization theorem. And okay, essentially we could distill out some of the analytic stuff that we didn't need and build the analog of this proof just in the graded algebraic side. Uh, secondly, so okay, so this theorem presumably works for, for any graded ring. In particular, if I start with an ungraded ring and I grade it in that sort of trivial way, then we get another proof of the equivalence of the two statements in the original uh, Morita theorem. 
And the third is, you know, up until this theorem, I think, it's fair to say that any, any conclusion that looked like FM of R and FM of S are isomorphic typically came from a top-down approach. You write down an isomorphism between big matrix rings and then you restrict. This one is actually more of a bottom-up approach. You view the FM R and the FM S rings as direct limits of nice unital subrings. Okay. So, so if we simply look at the original Morita theorem, at least the extended one, and we look at the statements M2 and M4, the isomorphism between a corner and the isomorphisms between the infinite, the, the FM rings, if you just naively say, well, I'm going to impose the standard gratings on the infinite matrices, the equivalent statement to M2 is not just the naive statement, well, that there exists some isomorphism between the ring and a corner of a matrix ring of the other one. You have to make sure that the appropriate item potent is full in the zero component. Okay. So look, so now we have the, I don't know, appropriate uh, graded analog of conditions M2 and M4 in the graded case where we choose to naively change M4 to the isomorphism between the FMs is graded in the standard grading. Okay, well, if we write that down as one of the two conditions, so what would be the appropriate categorical analog of that condition on the matrices? Okay, so again, in the interest of time, I won't go through all the details here, but there's a sort of straightforward, clear idea of what it means to be a graded module over a graded ring, that it decomposes in such a way that the appropriate multiplication, scalar multiplication, acts well with the gradings. We can talk about the category of graded modules and graded homomorphisms. Okay, so remember here was statement M1 from the original Morita theorem that the categories of mod R, the categories mod R and mod S are equivalent. So what should the appropriate analogous statement about the graded categories be? All right, well, when you have these graded modules, what you can do is talk about shifting the gradings, just like we were able to change gradings on the rings, we're able to change gradings on modules by shifting them, moving them over by some integer amount. And we'll call this the suspension functor, the one that shifts appropriately. So here's what it means to be an equivalence of graded module categories. We'll call it a graded equivalence. If there's a, a graded functor, in other words, a functor that behaves well with these suspension functors, such that standard definition, such that they compose appropriately to the identity functors on each category. And if there is such a graded equivalence, then we'll say that the rings, the graded rings A and B are graded Murray equivalent. Okay. So graded Murray equivalent is uh, an equivalence between the graded module categories that in addition plays well with this shift functor, with this suspension functor. Okay, now we can get from graded modules to any module, just forget that the module is graded. This is called the forgetful functor. And so now we're talking about a functor between the full module categories, but we're going to call it a graded functor in case it, in a sense, comes from a functor between the graded module categories. In other words, if you can start with a graded module, forget that it's graded, and then push over by this functor, do the same thing by this graded functor, and then push it up then we'll call that a graded functor between the full module categories. Okay, and finally, it's easy to show that if you start with a module over the zero component, that if you tensor that on the left with the ring S, then you get a graded right S module. And so we get a functor from the modules over the zero component to the graded modules over the ring S. And here's the definition that will allow us to write down the analogous condition in the M1 case. So we'll say that graded rings are homogeneously graded equivalent in case not only are they graded equivalent, but somehow that graded equivalence plays well with these functors from the zero components. So there's some consistency with these functors from the zero components in the grading. 
So this is just rephrased what homogeneously graded equivalent means. It means that if you tensor and then push over, it's the same as pushing over on this functor between the uh, modules of the zero components and then pushing up. So the extended Meridian theorem was what? That there was an equivalence between, well, between four types of statements. The first of which was a statement about categories of modules. The second of which was an isomorphism between rings. The fourth of which was this isomorphism between infinite matrix rings. And so here's the theorem that is the sort of analog of the original or extended Morita theorem in the context of, I'll say in the context of greater rings, but we have to be a little bit careful. So if I change M4 isomorphism between the FMs to isomorphism between the FMs that preserves the grading in the standard grading, then here are the appropriate equivalent conditions. We've seen HG2. Now here's the appropriate equivalence between some categories of modules that are as homogeneously graded equivalent to S. Okay, so what we're able to do, I'm not going to give you the proof, uh, but it turns out the proof of uh, HG1 and HG2, and now I've tipped my hand as to why the notation is HG, is homogeneous graded equivalence, uh, was already known. There's a great resource for all this information about graded rings. Uh, Ruzba Hazrat has been able to prove a lot of these results and has sort of uh, put most of them, listed a lot of them at least in this uh, London Mass Society lecture note series. Okay, so we get HG1, HG2, and HG4. So is there an HG3? Yeah, there is, but I don't really want to talk about that today just in the interest of time. So what we're able to do is take the extended Morita theorem and port over the theorem to the context of graded rings, again, where the, the sort of launch point is we're going to take M4 isomorphism between the FMs and assume that that isomorphism is a graded isomorphism between the FMs in the standard gradings. Okay, but not all gradings are standard. I mean, here was an example of a non-standard -gra grading on a ring. I'll call this grading number one on the three by three matrices over R, even though R itself might not be graded. Okay, here's another one that I just sort of, I don't know, randomly made up. Take any, not necessarily graded ring. Here's the zero component. Here's the five component. Here's the three component, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Okay, you can show that things multiply together correctly and it gives you a grading on the ring. Okay, I mean, this isn't random. Okay, look, if, if you take a graded ring, then you can grade the N by N matrix ring in the standard grading. But it's also the case if you take any ring, graded or not, that there's these gradings on the matrix rings that somehow come from the multiplication of the matrices. And what we can do is combine these two flavors of gradings that we get on the matrix rings in a systematic way. And the systematic way is take an M by a matrix ring over a graded ring, write down a sequence of integers of length N, and now I'm gonna deem what the grading on the N by a matrix ring is gonna be if you want to know what is in the T component, okay, the things in the T component have in their IJ coordinates elements taken from this coordinate or this component of the underlying graded ring. Okay, just write down the definition. It turns out you get a perfectly good graded ring, a grading on the N by N matrix ring over R. Okay, and just as a, a, a trivial example, on the three by three matrices, I choose 12, seven, and four, and then I build a grading on the three by three matrices. Here are the T components. Okay, and even in the case where R is not graded, in other words, you impose the trivial grading on R, you get grading number one here by using this particular, so you get all these gradings back just by using this more general notion of shifting the gradings around using both the grading in the original ring and the grading on the uh, th that's afforded by matrix multiplication. Okay, and here's just the notation. You give me some sequence in Zn, and we we tweak the grading on the n by matrices in this way. And I mean, it, it's straightforward to show because the definition of the gradings is given in terms of differences taken from the sequence. That if you shift everything in the sequence by a fixed amount, you get the same grading. And that if you hand me just a constant sequence, 
then the appropriate grading is just standard grading again. So we get this sort of systematic way of viewing more general gradings on matrix rings. And the same thing happens in the FMs. You play exactly the same games there. Okay, so here is what uh, Ruz Behazrat was able to prove. This is in the uh, LMS lecture notes uh, that I referred to before. There is some notion of graded equivalence between the module categories, but it turns out that graded equivalence between the module categories, remember, we're not requiring here anything about uh, homogeneous graded equivalence, just graded equivalence without this additional condition on the zero components, that there is some sense of isomorphism between a corner, but you have to be able to tweak the grading on the matrix ring in some appropriate way. And it turns out that's equivalent to some module, uh, bimodule condition that we can write down as well. So this was already known. And the question is, can we add a fourth statement that's sort of analogous to the isomorphism between the FMs that would be equivalent to the graded version, not the homogeneous graded version, but the graded version. And the answer is, yeah, you can do that. And it's essentially you can, if you allow me to tweak the grading on the FMs in an appropriate way, then you get the appropriate GM. Okay. And we're able to do that. You use Rusba's ideas and essentially it plays out relatively well in the infinite matrices. Okay, so, right. So let me at least conclude with, with, with the algebra piece by making an observation, which is if you're in a situation where the ring that you happen to have is strongly graded, which means that you don't just have containment when you multiply, that you actually have equality between RT and RT times RU and RT plus U, then this is a classic theorem of Dade from the late 60s, early 70s, I think, that in the strongly graded case, the tensor functor from the zero component to the graded modules is an equivalence of categories. So when we're talking about strongly graded rings, the notions of graded equivalence and homogeneous graded equivalence turn out to reduce to the same idea. Okay. And what I'll try to do if I have time at the end is give you some examples of Situations where we have equivalence, but not graded equivalence, and then graded equivalence, but not homogeneous graded equivalence. And the point will be, if I'm going to write down an example of graded equivalent, but not homogeneously graded equivalent, it's going to have to be in a situation where the ring is not strongly graded. Okay, so because of the specific uh, nature of this particular seminar, I mean, I have sort of two roads that I could go down in the final 10-ish minutes or so of this presentation. One is to talk about connections to Levitt path algebra, so to nobody's surprise here, I guess. Uh, the other is to at least make some connections to the C-star algebras. So I'm on a little bit shaky ground here. I have to admit I have a little bit of imposter syndrome when I'm talking about C-star algebras, but I'm going to give it a shot here. And please feel free to interrupt and correct if you have any comments here. So. When, when working with my two colleagues, Efren and Mark, I got a sense of how C-star algebra folks view the notion of Marita equivalence. And I mean, apparently there was some wrestling around in the early days of trying to understand what the right notion of Marita equivalence for C-star algebra should be. But essentially what was settled on was some notion of maybe Riffel that we should talk about, I guess, what sometimes is referred to as strong Marita equivalence as the sort of correct idea. And the correct idea is effectively the existence of something called an imprimitivity Hilbert bimodule between the two C star algebras, which you should think of essentially as being the, the sort of moral analog of condition M3 that I didn't talk about much here at all. You have two bimodules that tensor together appropriately to give nice things, that that's the from the C star side, sort of the correct notion of what um, of what Marita equivalence should be. Now it turns out that that notion, that tensor notion, can be traded in for a, a notion of if it's the case that when you take the the given C star algebras A and B and you tensor with the the compact operators with K, that those should be stably isomorphic 
And that happens if and only if the appropriate C star algebras are merely equivalent. So there's some reasonable way, reasonable, there's some other way of understanding what it means to say that the C star algebras are Merit equivalent from this tensoring of bimodules point of view, it's if there's an appropriate isomorphism between rings that are related to the given C star algebras, namely the tensor product with the compacts. But here's the point, the compact operators are just the closure of the FM infinities over the complex numbers. And then the tensor product, this is to, to Willie's question or slash point that uh, was asked earlier, and then the tensor product of the C star algebra with the compacts is the closure of the FM infinities. So the tensor product of the C star algebra with the compacts is really sort of the analytic analog of the FM infinities. So having A stably isomorphic to B, in other words, having the tensor with the compacts over A being isomorphic to tensor with the compacts over B is sort of is the correct analytic analog of our condition M4. So for, for, the, for the C star algebra folks, even though for the ring theory folks, this initially was not really a, I don't know, a comfortable or maybe important condition to have an isomorphism between the FMs from the C star algebra side, that actually turns out to be one of the, the more interesting uh, entry points into this notion of meridian equivalence. Right. So let's see, how am I doing for time here, Willie? Five five minutes, maybe? Yeah, it's seven, eight, six. Okay, seven, eight, okay. So here, for example, is how this plays out in the specific context of graph C star algebras. So in graph C star algebras, there's, there's an action of the, the circle on the graph C star algebra. Here's how it's described on the appropriate generators of the graph C star algebra. And we call this gauge action. And this gauge action induces a grading on the C star algebra. Okay, actually it induces a grading on the sort of algebraic uh, primordial version of the C star algebra. So here's how you grade the algebraic structure and then you take a closure. And the theorem is, at least for finite graphs, so there's a star isomorphism between the appropriate C star algebras that's compatible with this, um, this gauge action, if and only if there's a graded star isomorphism between the appropriate C star algebras. Okay, and I mean, I don't wanna to spend too much time on this just to sort of pay some lip service to here's what's going on in the C star algebra side. We can then talk about the stabilized action on the um, appropriate tensor products on the appropriate stabilizations of these things. And the theorem is this, that if you take two graphs, then there's a star isomorphism between the stabilizations that's compatible with the, uh, with the appropriate action, if and only if there's a graded star isomorphism between the given, um, the given, excuse me, the, the, the given stabilizations. Okay, so this is the, the C star analog of condition HG4. And there's a C star algebra analog to HG1 in situations more general than the ones I've just described in the context of graph C star algebras. Uh, Efren sort of worked out the details, or at least in the process of working out the details. I will briefly flash the slide up here. I mean, I'll make the slides available to, to, to Willie and the organizers if you want to post these online. So here is the theorem. Again, this is still unpublished and in work, but the point is that there is an appropriate HG1 analog, that there's some appropriate statement about some compatibility with what's happening in zero components. Okay, so let me spend the last three or four minutes giving you some connections to Levitt path algebras. So Levitt path algebra, I, apologies to those of you that aren't familiar with these, but uh, having looked at the participant list, I think most of you are. Uh, so here's the standard grading, or I want to use the word standard again. Here is the usual grading on a Levitt path algebra. You put uh, terms of the form PQ Q star in the N component in case the length of P minus the length of Q is paths are N. Uh, then Rusba was able to prove that at least for finite graphs, that in this grading, 
the appropriate Levitt path algebra is strongly graded if and only if the graph has no sinks. So if the question is about graded equivalence versus homogeneous graded equivalence, uh, the two ideas are the same if you're looking at Levitt path algebras that at least have no sinks. Okay, but when the graphs have sinks, then things become a little bit more problematic, a little bit more interesting if you want. Uh, so the definition is, here's what the paths look like. They're just the finite paths that I'm interested in. And the proposition, a proposition we're able to prove is this. So take, a, uh, take two graphs that each have just one sink, then homogeneous graded equivalence turns out to be the same as asking what's the longest path in E that lands at the sink, and then what's the longest path in F that lands at the sink? I'm sorry, I have to assume the graphs are acyclic so that the notion of longest path makes sense. Then it turns out that homogeneous graded equivalence is the same as those two maximum length paths being the same length. Okay, the details I'm going to leave out here. But as sort of a cute example, okay, so here are two graphs. Uh, obviously, each has one sink. The length of the longest paths are different. One actually has a path of length one. The other has no path that ends in the sink. So these can't be homogeneously graded equivalent by this proposition. Okay, but what are these Levitt path algebras? Well, it's well known the Levitt path algebra of just one vertex is the field and the Levitt path algebra of this second graph F is just the two by two matrices. Okay, so obviously those are Merida equivalent. And the natural Z grading on these things is easy to describe. It's nothing more than, okay, for K, it's just you put everything in K. For the two by two matrices, the upper right corner has degree one, the lower left corner has degree minus one, and the things on the main diagonal have degree zero. So the gradings are easy to describe. Clearly, the FMs are isomorphic. You just forget that the things on the right are two by two matrices. You just remove all the parentheses to get an isomorphism. The isomorphism can't be graded in the standard grading. Okay. By the previous proposition, it can't because the rings aren't homogeneously graded equivalent. But I mean, it's easy to see they can't be isomorphic in standard grading because the zero component in the left-hand side is everything. And the, the thing on the right has things in the non-zero component. But you can turn this isomorphism into a graded isomorphism if you regrade the FM infinities just by sort of changing things out so that the gradings become the same as they would become in the standard grading over FM of M2. So they are graded Merida equivalent. Okay. Um, let me just, yeah, quickly, because I don't have the, the, the I'll, I'll just do this quickly. So here's an example of two Levitt path algebras that are Merida equivalent, in fact, graded Merida equivalent, but not homogeneously graded equivalent. There are examples of Levitt path algebras that are Merida equivalent, but not graded Merida equivalent. They're relatively easy to write down. You look at the, you look at the Laurent polynomials and the two by two matrices over the Laurent polynomials with an appropriate grading, and those will give an example of that second type. Okay. And I think in the interest of time, I will pass through that and thank you very much. Okay, thank you, Jean. Uh, for a wonderful talk. Uh, I have some questions, um, but I would defer them if um, some participant uh, else other than me wants to ask something. Otherwise, I'll go ahead and ask. Uh, uh, Okay, <clears throat> so uh, uh, you rushed through the couple, the last couple of uh, slides where Hastrat's conjecture was mentioned. So yes. do you have an application to Hazard's conjecture? I don't have an, we don't have an application to ah. Hazard's conjecture. Ah. Uh, uh, 
Uh, okay. But, yeah. Okay. I mean, the, the point is I'd like to at least make this a little bit more well known because I think it's important, but okay. I mean, the, his conjecture is about the V, the graded V monoid, the V monoid of graded finally generated projective modules. Okay, so we're looking at equivalences between graded module categories. So that will restrict to some sort of connection between the monoids of uh, finally generated graded modules. Might there be a connection? Maybe. So let's see, how did I describe it? That our work is tangentially related to Hazrat's conjecture. Okay. Okay. But this was more of a possible way for me to make this conjecture a little bit more well known. Uh, uh, so, um, the, 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 the equivalence between the um, graded monet equivalence in the sense of Ruthven and the your version with infinite matrices. So I think you can formulate it as saying that you have some set uh, X uh, equipped, uh, I mean, possibly countable set X, eh? um, equipped with some function to the integers with which you, which you use to equip the finite matrices supported on the finitely supported matrices uh, indexed by X, uh, so that when you do, so MX of M infinity is isom of one ring is isomorphic to MX of M infinity of the other. Mm -hmm. Something like, like that, right? Uh, I mean, it, 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 so, um, there is this notion of, um, uh, stability that um, uh, Eugenia, who is the owner of the license, Zoom license we are using, um, uh, developed um, um, for um, defining um, um, bivariant K theory uh, of algebra equipped with a grading of a group. And uh, I think uh, being uh, stable in that sense is. is analogous being a stable equivalent in, in the sense they are developed is analogous to uh, this isomorphism between the uh -huh. yeah, if, the mx the main infinity or something like this. If you have the reference, can you put it in the chat maybe? Yeah, I, I can send you, uh, let me see. Just a sec. I can send the papers. Yeah. So that that that's okay. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. How do I add, uh, how do I put the uh, uh, ah yeah okay. Then yeah, I see it. Okay. This other paper we wrote with, uh, with Guido. It's perfect. Uh, okay. This, um, I will look at that after. Okay. Uh, a quick uh, yes. question yeah. while you I'm are. Hi. Um, I realize the motivation for grading by Z. Uh, comes from C star and other factors. 
may be graded by a different group, or maybe too complicated. Uh, question. So instead of thinking of these rings as being Z graded, the question is if we fix some other abelian group, can we get some analogous results? Yeah. Yeah, I, I certainly my my intuition is yes, especially because much of Ruzba's book is about some arbitrary grading group gamma rather than just the integers. But at least for here, of course, our motivation was to use the integers only because this is the standard grading on Levitt path algebra. But I assume that the answer is yes, that there should be appropriate analogs to each of these statements for, I don't know, for arbitrary abelian groups, at, at least maybe finite cyclic groups, we should be able to do something like this. There's also the matter that, I mean, sorry, uh, did I interrupt you, Ranga? No, no. Okay, no. so there's also the matter that uh, gradings are coactions of the group algebra, of the group mm. right? And <clears throat> so um, one can ask the dual thing. If you have, instead of having a, a group coacting, you have a group acting. So suppose you have a group that acts on, uh, say, your graph, then they, this induces a great, uh, an action by your homophysians in the ring. And uh, then you may ask whether there is a, an equivariant uh, version of monetary equivalence. But there is some question in the chat. I, I read it. Uh, can you roughly describe the right generalization of N3, namely the existence of relevant by modules inducing the homogeneous building equivalent? Yeah. What form would it take? Uh, I don't have that here. Let's see. I'm not sure we included that in the article, but there is an appropriate uh, generalization of the existence of rel relevant by modules. But um, let me. If I can get your email address, I will try to send that information to you. Thank you. See, are, there, are there any more questions? Okay, otherwise I will uh, stop the the recording, I just sent uh, this article that we have with uh, Guido Arnone on the uh, case here. We also prove a version of that. Uh, uh, okay. I various things in, in the case. Okay. <clears throat> Thank so. you, Eugene, for the talk. If you want to submit the slides, I can put them on, on the website. I, I, I will send you the slides this afternoon. Thank you. Thank you.